right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Brooke Schumann. I'm with the TCU Alumni Association, and we're so glad to have all of you logging on right now. Um, looks like we have a lot of people still connecting. So welcome, and we'll make some introductions today to our guest speaker and the TCU staff uh, that are here. Um, the resume topic is always one of our most common, most popular topics when it comes to career or professional development. Uh, no matter where you are in your career journey, updating your resume is just something we all need to do. Uh, so very excited to have Hallie Crawford today. Uh, but before we introduce Hallie, I'm gonna introduce my colleague uh, from across campus, Terrence Hood. Terrence, if you wanna introduce yourself. Sure, hello everyone. I'm Terrence Hood, Associate Director for Alumni and Student Athletes in our TCU Career Center. And so I wanna welcome everyone to our conversation with Hallie today. I'm thrilled to learn as well. After 20 plus years in this industry, there's always something else to learn. So I'm happy to hear from Hallie. And um, when I do appointments with alumni, number one appointment is resume. So I'm curious to stay on top of things, whether you're entry level, mid-level, senior level, career transitioner, there's always something to be known about resumes, always nuggets to apply to your own experience. So welcome everyone and Hallie, thank you for being with us. Thank you, pleasure and to be here. With that, we'll turn it over to you, Hallie. Okay, wonderful. We have lots to cover. Yes, thank you all for your time today um, and having me. I'm thrilled to be here as well. We, this, it's the same for us um, as career coaches. Our clients want to dig into the nitty gritty with resume because it's something practical, tangible that they can latch on to. And I feel like, you know, resume rules change so often, like resumes just get kind of fancier and fancier over time, all the way to people asking us, will resumes eventually be obsolete because of LinkedIn? We're not there yet, but there are lots of different things, kind of trends to stay on top of with um, your resume. So we're going to be talking about kind of how to pass the the 10 second resume test today. Um, and uh, just quick background about me, I'm Hallie Crawford. I'm a certified career coach. I started my coaching business over 21 years ago with, um, I have an undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt University and a graduate degree from the University of Illinois. And we have a team of coaches that help people navigate their job search, update their LinkedIn and resume. There's lots of complimentary information on our website, which is listed here. Please feel free to visit that. We're trying to help people as much as possible because we know that due to COVID and now kind of post COVID, I'm not sure we can say that quite yet. Um, but a lot of people have been in this career transition mode. And there was a recent survey that came out um, that said that one in four professionals are actually going to consider making a jump and changing jobs, whether it's changing industries completely or just changing to another organization as we start to go back to the office because people have different feelings about that. So I feel like with that going on, as well as with this concept of the gig economy, if you will, where people are changing jobs more often than ever, it's really important to keep your resume up to date. And then if you overlay that, obviously, if any of you on the call today were furloughed or laid off due to COVID, it's, you know, that adds a whole nother layer of complexity. How do I deal with that on my resume? So whether you are searching for a new job or kind of a side gig to help kind of supplement your income, um, or if you're not interested in going back to the office full time, and that's what your organization is saying, all of the tips that we're going to be talking about today relative to your resume will um, be applicable to any of these scenarios and situations. We are recording today, so you all will get a copy of that. And just by the way, too, we will have time at the end for Q&A. But please feel free to enter in your questions kind of as we go while you're thinking of them so you don't forget by the end. That would be something that I would do. Um, so feel free to enter those in and we can answer if there's kind of a critical mass kind of halfway through. We can go ahead and answer some of those as we go too. The other reason why we wanted to talk with you about your resume today is because honestly, no one really likes updating their resume. Unfortunately, I don't think we've ever had anyone say, I love updating my resume and I love job searching. That's usually not the case. 
it's really overwhelming for people for so many different reasons. They don't know what kind of formatting to, you know, put it into and how does it look? What, what does contemporary look like these days? A lot of our clients will tell us they don't feel like they're a good writer and they don't know how to sell themselves effectively. And some people just put it off and put it off because they don't know where to start. So there's lots of different kind of roadblocks or obstacles and we get that. So what we wanted to kind of share with you today is some step-by-step kind of nuggets and pieces that will help you um, update your resume over time. Just by the way, as we're talking about this and thinking about not just the importance on this slide, but it's not a good idea, just as a side note, to sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna get my resume all updated in the next like three hours or something like that. That's not a good idea. You wanna do it in bits and pieces because you need a fresh pair of eyes. So it's good to work on your resume a little bit, put it down, come back to it in a few hours or the next day. Give yourself several days of kind of working on it and updating it. And we also tell our clients that your resume really should be an organic kind of living document that when you learn something new from um, an informational interview, someone you've spoken to that tells you, oh, in this particular industry, they're looking for these keywords on their resume. You want to add those. So always be willing to be open and kind of learn about new things that you could change or adjust your resume as kind of a living and breathing document, not just, okay, I'm done. So the reason why, um, if you take a look at this next slide, the reason why we're talking about this 10 second test is stats have shown that employers and recruiters and hiring managers, they usually spend like 10 to 15 seconds scanning a resume. And as we all know, there's lots of people looking out there. So the competition can be really steep. And it's very important to make your resume very readable and kind of I want to say almost like user friendly. We were looking at um, a resume of a client actually just earlier this morning. And when I popped open her document, I was like, whoa, this looks completely overwhelming. I actually don't almost want to read it because there's just so much there and I don't know where to start. So the first thing we want you to get kind of an understand is we want your resume to be very scannable and readable, where you include enough white space that it looks appealing to the eye and something that someone would be comfortable, not just reading, but scanning through quickly. And employers and recruiters, and I'll just move to this next slide really quickly so you guys can read it while I'm talking, but employers and recruiters, they want to see like the bolded items, like where you worked what organizations you worked at, what the dates were of those of that employment, and also what your job title was. Those are the things that they're kind of scanning for. So those are the things you want to have stand out in your um, professional experience. And then we also, and we'll show you this in a minute, we want you always to have a quick summary at the top too that they can scan through and read pretty quickly. So I think we all kind of know why a solid resume is so important. I won't read these stats to you because you can read them, but you know the competition can be very steep. It's hard to know and understand how to stand out from the crowd. And one of the things that you really need to understand in order to help you update your resume is what kind of your brand is and starting to come up with like a branding kind of tagline statement and also what your unique selling points are and what we mean by that is what kind of unique combination of skills strengths and experience do you have that not all of your colleagues or your competition would have okay so a client we were working with this morning she was actually a lawyer but also a project manager as well. So she has this great blend of the legal expertise and also the ability to be really detailed with documents and projects, as well as just the overall kind of big picture project management um, skill set. And that would be a unique, um, her unique set of experiences and expertise. So let's talk about kind of the three criteria first that um, we use to get our clients to think about if their resume represents them effectively and if it's gonna pass that 10 second test. And we'll get to our first poll here in just a moment. Perfect, Brooke, thank you, that's awesome. So the three criteria that you wanna be thinking about when you're evaluating your resume is it needs to sell you effectively, it needs to brand you though too, and those are two different things, and it needs to make you feel confident. You wanna feel good about it. So whatever advice you kind of take in, you want to adjust it based on what feels right to you, based on your industry and your role, et cetera. So let's go ahead and do this first poll here. If your resume truly represents you based on these three criteria, okay? 
And this would be the selling you, branding you, and making you feel confident. And we understand if a lot of you are going to say no here, which is why you're here today. We just kind of wanted to get a sense of things. And Brooke, when you can, when we've got a critical mass, if you'll share the results, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, we still have a lot coming in. I think we've kind of hit a, a peak here, so. Okay, cool. No worries. Oh, it's split like 50-50. Okay, good. So there's more people actually out there that are fitting this criteria. That's fantastic. So we've got 48% are saying yes, it does, which is great. And 52% that are saying no. So you're in the right place if you feel like you're not. And for those of you who feel like this is the case, take away those little nuggets and adjustments that you feel that you need to make based on making it really scannable and readable, which is you know one of the main things we're talking about today. And as we said too, to kind of tailor our advice, we'll do the Q&A at the end as well. So here are five ways that we want you to consider um, updating and kind of fixing your resume so that it is very easy to read, scan, and get through quickly, but also attracts the attention of prospective employers. We want you to think about these five things. The formatting is actually really important. This is not just fluff. Formatting makes a big difference in terms of if someone actually wants to read it. And again, if it's scannable, the branding is critically important. And we'll show you what we mean by that as we go here today. It's not just about selling your strengths and skills, but it's about who are you as a professional and kind of what mark have you made in your industry, so to speak. We'll talk about your summary at the top, making sure that all of your pieces or components to your resume and the content is always relevant. Relevance is critically important. If there's anything in your resume, usually the rule of thumb, that if it's over 10 years old, you don't need to include it unless for some reason it's still relevant. Also, if there are jobs that you've had in the past, that are not relevant to the new career path that you're pursuing, for example, you can list those on there, but you want to keep them short and sweet so that they get to the rest of your experience that would be relevant. So don't include things on your resume, bottom line, that aren't relevant to the job you're applying for. And then we'll talk next about employment history. These are kind of, this is your checklist, so to speak, of five things. Really quickly, if anyone would like a copy of our PowerPoint in addition to the recording, the email address is on this slide. It's admin at halliecrawford.com. Feel free to ask us for those. We'd be happy to share. Let's talk about formatting first. Um, some of our clients, I think a long time ago, were like, really, does this matter? And it does matter in terms of you want your resume to look more contemporary and up to date versus like from the 1980s or something like that. I think I'm aging myself, but that's OK. All right. So here's one example of a format that we will sometimes use with our clients. And a couple of the things I wanted to point out to you um, in terms of the formatting, again, to make it easy to scan, they can get through it quickly, is it's really a good idea to section out your resume into different components or pieces so that they can get the information that they want, um, most importantly, very quickly. You'll notice here that there's areas of expertise in this side column and a quick career overview for this particular client. Then at the top here, she's got a quick summary and then her professional experience, again, Everything stands out that they want to quickly see and scan the name of the company, her job title, and the dates as well. We do recommend that people use like one color, probably like we could consider this being two colors, no more than two, but use color on your resume. It does help it look more contemporary and stand out from the crowd, more appealing. Um, and you can use it um, in different places, just like for your headings, so to speak. So again, you want this to be very easy and read, um, easy to scan and readable. And using this as an example, as like a side column is one way to help certain things stand out. So boom, 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 they can get right to where they want to be. One other thing to just remind everyone too, is we do want you to have your LinkedIn profile at the top in your header, because we also want them to be able to quickly get to your LinkedIn profile as well. It's another way to sell yourself. So make sure that that's there too. All right, let's keep going to talk about or continue on formatting. So a couple of other like rules of thumb with formatting is you want it to look consistent in terms of the font. Don't make it look like a circus where there's different colors and font sizes everywhere. 
A lot of our clients, we will find their, their layout is inconsistent. Make sure that the layout is consistent between the different sections. Make sure that you have enough white space, that your margins are not too small. Again, easy to scan. And two things that we would um, be careful of and avoid when you're creating your resume to apply for jobs online so that they can get through those scanners is you don't wanna have underlining on your resume and you don't wanna have tables in there or columns that could kind of trip them up, okay? So it's a good idea to have what we would call like a pretty format of your resume, which would be the example that we just showed you that looks nicer that you can use for the interview process and for networking, but one that's a little bit plainer, but still broken out into different sections that doesn't have those tables or columns because those can mess up the ATS scanners online. So you just wanna be careful about that. Another thing to pay attention to with your resume is when you're uploading it onto a job board or when you're emailing it, you wanna put it into or translate it into a PDF version because the PDF will hold the formatting regardless of how they open it. If you keep it in Word and they pop it open um, and their version of Word and it's version you know, 2012 or whatever it is, the formatting can get wonky and messed up. So you wanna make sure that you translate it into a PDF each time and two of the other things that um, are actually, I should say, one of the other things that we have found our clients kind of a common mistake is they will overuse um, bolding, italics, or they'll capitalize everything. They'll capitalize things that they think should be kind of proper nouns, but actually really shouldn't be. So your job title at the very beginning in your summary can be capitalized but don't keep capitalizing it after that. Don't capitalize, you know, um, project management just because it's a keyword in your summary and you think that'll make it stand out. Make sure that you don't overuse capitalization and only use it for the places that it should be. And be careful with the underlining, like we said, don't include that and don't bold too many things because again, you wanna draw their eye to the things that appeal to them the most. And that would be your job title, your company name, and the dates where you worked there, okay? Let's take a look at this next template here for just a second. So this is one of the templates also that we use with our clients. And this template we actually is our favorite because it looks pretty, but it can also get past the ATS scanners. Because if you look at this, there's no tables in here, there's no columns, but there's still a little bit of shading to kind of help certain areas stand out, which is really important as we said. And it also has that nice use of color as well. So a couple of the components, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we chat today. Um, again, remember you wanna have your contact information here at the top. Use your LinkedIn profile link instead of your mailing address or your physical address. People typically don't do that anymore, unless for some reason, if your phone number is from out of state and you wanna let them know you're actually local, you could put your location like Houston, Texas or whatever it is, but usually full mailing address, not relevant these days. Um, and it's also kind of a privacy thing too. Um, this is where we want you to bring that a relative. I'm sorry, Hallie, because that was actually one of the questions. And I feel like this is a good question to interject right, right Perfect. here, because since you're talking about it, but is that a relatively new practice with you know, not newer. disclosing a personal address? It is a little bit newer. Yeah. So um, honestly, I've still seen people when, you know, they start with us in coaching, they, a lot of people will still have their mailing address. So I think that we're on the, it is a new practice that people are just starting to get and understand. So it's newer um, and it's definitely something I would do for a lot of different reasons. So good, thank you for interjecting Brooke, feel free to. Um, so that's one of the things we want you to think about for your header for sure. And um, then we want you to also brand yourself. So again, going, to this 10 second, they need to know exactly who you are right away. This is another common mistake that we see with our clients is they'll have, for example, they'll say here, summary or a professional profile or professional summary. And totally understand that because a lot of people have done that in the past, but it doesn't tell us who you are. 
think of your resume as precious real estate, where you want to use all of the space that you have there as wisely as possible. So if it were me, for example, I would have certified career coach here at the top, and then I would have a branding statement about, you know, kind of like my elevator pitch about what we do as a company to help professionals. So it's really important to have not just your summary statement, as in the example here, but also that you brand yourself and tell them who you are as a professional. And you're gearing that, by the way, towards the job that you're applying for. So for example, this person, if they're applying for a job that's process improvement director, for example, I would have them change this to senior process improvement director instead of just the generic professional, okay? Then you wanna have your tagline, which we'll talk about more in just a moment, summary. And then in this section here, if you take a look here, this would be their core competencies, so to speak. But this is the section that is really good for those keywords to help you get by those ATS scanners. That's where you would put those. And then we move to your professional experience. Again, very easily sectioned out. And then um, the relevant experience under here. Okay. Ali, we've got a couple questions actually. Two different people have asked about more about formatting, formatting and things to avoid. Are there yeah. colors or fonts? That people should avoid, especially with these scanners. You know, is hot pink maybe not a thing? I mean, obviously at TCU we would never avoid purple, but is there a color or a font that you would steer clear of with your clients? Yep, that's a great question. We tend to like the blues, like different form colors of blue, but airing on the side of a little bit darker. Um, we think the reds are okay. Both of those are kind of stronger colors. I'm not against purple or yellow or those kinds of things, but they are a little bit um, untraditional. So what I will say is it, when we tell our clients, it's usually like a blue or, you know, a red. Um, if you get into something like yellow or whatever, then you can't read it, you know, and I just think kind of sticking with those two standard colors is better. In terms of font, um, there really isn't a font that's terrible, but I would err on the side of more rounded fonts because sometimes when you get into these, um, you know, tighter or funkier fonts, they're just harder to read. So a font like Arial or Verdana, those are the ones we usually suggest to our clients. Those are great questions. Okay, let's keep going. So let's talk about the branding. Um, and obviously, so for this step number two, we can't just say on our resume, I'm good at stuff. I just always like that image. So I always have to use it because I think it's funny. Okay. So let's look at branding here. Now, when we're talking about branding, so I gave you an example just a moment ago, a little bit more about branding yourself is about having that title there, but also ideally like a tagline, almost like a company would have. Okay. So let me walk you through this header. Um, this is a very unique header for someone who is in a more creative and a marketing type of field, okay? So we're not saying that you need to use this exact header, but I just wanted to give you some examples about the components that are good to have and another alternative. So um, with this person, her PhD is relevant to the jobs she'd be applying for. So it is a good idea to put MBA or PhD, again, if they're relevant to the jobs you're applying for and if they're not gonna like price you out of the salary range, if they're not going to worry, ooh, they're going to, you know, require too much, um, too high of a salary. Um, this person has their address here. Remember, we said that's a no-no, so we want to focus on phone number, obviously, email address, and your LinkedIn profile. But this is really what I want you to look at here: is you want to come up with whether you put it in the format that we talked about before, that is our favorite, or something like this. You want to come up with some kind of tagline that explains to them what you're known for, kind of what your elevator speech is. So if we can go ahead and launch this second poll while people are taking a look at this, this would be great. But when you think about your branding statement here, you wanna think about, it's almost like you would put your the first sentence of your elevator speech. If someone else was talking about you and what you're known for, what would you say there? And that should be your branding statement. It summarizes like, okay, I'm great at this, but I'm also great at this other piece. 
my elevator speech um, as a coach is we help people find jobs that make them want to jump out of bed in the morning. Now, would I put that exactly on my resume? No, but a variation of that that is more professional and short and sweet would be what we put there. So I'm curious how many people actually have a header like we've talked about with this branding statement that really brands them effectively. Okay, so 81% say they do not. Okay, so good. This is one of the first things that we'd like you all to work on is thinking about that branding statement. Run it by a friend or family member. Run it by us in a coaching session, whatever is best. He, I've given you two examples. And if you get copies of the PowerPoint slide, like we said, there's a, an example here and on the previous one as well to kind of give you a sense of what you can say there. But remember, it's basically what you would be known for and what people would say about you you know, when they talk about the value and results that you, you would provide, okay? We want you definitely, if we take a look at this next slide here, we want your tagline and that summary and um, everything else at the top to be um, targeting the path that you're going for, okay? So we want you to tailor all of those pieces to the job that you're applying for. So every time, yes, your resume does need to be tailored for each job. And even with that branding statement at the top, for example, if you've got something in there that wouldn't be as relevant to the particular job you're applying for because you're looking at something else just to try it and see what happens, you want to remove that word or two and put in a different word. And I'll give you an example of this in just a moment. Um, one of the other things that we have found that we actually kind of like our, our clients to do if they can fit it in and have room, it's another way to help you stand out from the crowd is to take very short excerpts of your testimonials or recommendations um, on your LinkedIn profile. And you can put those right underneath your summary and quotes there. Use ones that would speak to that particular job that you're applying for. But using excerpts of testimonials actually can really help you like stand out from the crowd as well. It's something a little bit unique and different that not everybody does. Now, when we're talking about tailoring your resume to the particular job, I'll give you this quick example here that I wanted to share. One of our clients, she um, had worked at Coca-Cola in corporate fraud and investigation. And part of her role there was to actually go seek out and identify um, when there was fraud, you know, happening, when someone was misusing their logo, you know, whatever it was. She was actually applying for two, two different jobs, one at Volvo and one at a uh, family-owned business. These were both actually in Texas. Um, and the Volvo job was actually managing the corporate whistleblowing program versus going out and investigating and finding it, it would be when other people would report in about what was going on, something they found. The job at the family owned business was about investigating it. So every time in her resume that it said investigation for the Volvo job, she switched that out with program management, which was not inaccurate and a lie for her because she actually did have that experience. You can't you know, lie on your resume, obviously. But that's the way she tailored her resume is, again, using the right language and adjusting what she did and her description of her position so that it fit what she was going for. OK, so when you're thinking about branding yourself, again, it's your resume is not everything plus the kitchen sink or whatever that saying is. I always get it wrong. You want to make sure that the story that you're telling all throughout your resume is relevant to the job applied for and take anything else out that would kind of throw them off the scent, if you will. All right, let's talk next about number three, and this is profile summary. Your profile summary, we showed you a few moments ago. It's about a paragraph. We would say, you know, three or three to five sentences, give or take. And it should make the reader want to read further in your resume. So it should be jazzy, so to speak, compelling, use active verbs, talk about the skills and results that you bring to the table and the value that you bring or could bring to their bottom line. Um, as much as possible, we would recommend throughout your resume, including in your summary, include measurable results. If there's numbers that you can incorporate, percentages or other tangible results, and also include in there too in your summary, your most impressive accomplishments. If there's a couple of accomplishments career-wise that you really want to stand out, 
go ahead and put those at the end of your summary as part of that too, so that they're getting um, a flavor of who you are as a professional, but also kind of your top two accomplishments as well. And by the way, if any of you have been furloughed or unemployed, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to um, manage that um, as we go here in a, a possible hybrid format for your resume as well, okay? So let me just share this other kind of example of a profile summary here. And Brooke, just really quickly, how are we doing on questions? Do we have more that we should dive into here for a second? We, we have a lot of question, questions, but nothing that we can kind of like pull them all together at the end. They're kind of more okay. broad based. Okay, cool. No problem. Good. Just wanted to check. Okay, so with your profile summary, here's another example of how to handle this. Okay, so again, you see the person's name, their phone, email, they need to have their LinkedIn address here, but this is branding themselves again. Another way to create your summary statement is also if you want to, you can create it as a bulleted list here with um, a quick summary of your skills before each of them too. We like that as another option as well, if it would be relevant um, to your situation. And there's certain skills that you really wanna pull out from them, okay? Um, if any of you would like to get more help with this, because we know it's kind of a lot, we do offer a low cost discounted option for TCU alumni to help you with your resume and give you the templates that we have, all of that. Just email us about that if you'd like that. So let's talk about number four and the relevance as well, because this is really important as we talked about before. What we would suggest, okay, to help you with um, staying organized with your resume and also, not having like 10 different resumes because we realize that when people start to apply and they're tailoring their resume to different positions, then a lot of times they end up with all these different resumes and they kind of get lost in the shuffle. So one of the things that we think is incredibly important is to start out with all of the tips that we're giving you today and create a master version of your resume that has all of the content in there that could be relevant to any of the jobs that you might be applying for. This master copy of your resume is not one that you would send out to people because it can have notes in there about what you might need to change and tweak um, based on the job you're applying for, notes to yourself. But the master copy is something that has all of your content that you can just kind of copy and paste and take things out of so that when you're ready to send it out, it's ready to go. So with this next poll here, we'd love to hear how many people have what they would consider a master copy of their resume again, that they don't send out to people, but that has everything there, and then they can just kind of chop it up, which again is what we would recommend. So we'll give you a moment to do that. And as we're doing this, actually, remember as much as you possibly can, just really quick, important reminder about um, making sure that you're or related to making sure that your resume is really scannable. As much as you possibly can, you want to quantify your results and spell out the results that you've provided to each employer in your previous jobs. Okay, so quantify as much as you possibly can every single time. So it's about 50-50 here, a little bit over 50% um, don't have a master copy and 45% do. Thank you all for participating in that poll. This is kind of a newer idea. Most people haven't thought of this um, in terms of having that master copy. Remember, just as a quick reminder, it's something that is for you to use, but it will make tailoring your resume so much easier if you use that master copy and just kind of cut things out that you need to. Um, there are other things that we wanted to just um, throw out there ideas that we've been giving to our clients, especially during COVID to kind of get in front of people is another thing you can do to um, send to the hiring manager or to the recruiter is create like a side by side list of requirements and qualifications. That's something that you can um, put into your cover letter. If they ask you for one, you can email it to someone on LinkedIn, the hiring manager, different ways to kind of get in front of people so that you can get their attention and then attach your resume from there too. Let's talk next about number five, and that's our employment history. And I want to make sure we have lots of time for a Q&A here. So we're going to keep moving. In terms of your employment history, we've got a lot of clients will ask us about this, whether they need to use, for example, a chronological or a functional um, layout for their resume. So we'll talk about those um, on this next slide here first. 
So in terms of your professional history or employment history, there's basically, and most of you probably have heard about these, there's three ways to highlight your history. Chronological is the most common, where it's in chronological order, date order, based on the most or the most recent job is obviously going to be at the top. A functional resume is for those people who are trying to transition into a different industry or a different career path. And this um, is where you organize your resume based on types of skills, experience, and strengths versus chronological. So for example, using me, I would say like training and development would be one of my you know, functions at the top of my resume before my employment history, um, coaching and training, or sorry, training and development, um, workshops and coaching. So a functional resume is where you list out your strengths in order of what would be most important and relevant experience in order of what would be most important for that job. So instead of having things in date order, you would have, okay, this is my strength for coaching and then your jobs for coaching underneath that, okay? And then a hybrid format of a resume is where you have a hybrid of the functional and chronological kind of blended together. And I'll show you what I mean by this in just a moment. Okay. One thing I wanted to say related to COVID, if any of you, if your projects were cut short or if you were furloughed or unemployed due to COVID, we wanted to let you know that up front, you can say something about that in your resume and explain it and just really lay it out there. As we have here at the bottom, um, there's an example for you. So you don't have to worry about, oh, what do I say if there's a gap and something happened? You can go ahead and explain what happened, you know, this is why the, the date was so short or the employment length of employment was so short. Just say the department was eliminated or furloughed or laid off due to COVID-19 budget, you know, um, cuts and restrictions. So it's okay to mention that not just in your cover letter, but these days in your resume as well. Okay. Allie, speaking of gaps, we did have a question about employment gaps for, you know, all kinds of various reasons. Um, do you have um, suggestions on, you know, how to address that, or maybe is it a use a functional model over a chronological model? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So what we would do is we would um, use a functional model if you have some big gaps, but um, if your gap is a little bit shorter and hasn't been, let's say longer than like six months. What I would do instead is keep the chronological format and just let them know what you've been doing since that time, classes that you've taken, um, volunteer work that you've done or anything else. And if you haven't had any of those things, you could just say in there furloughed or laid off due to COVID-19 and then put the dates that would be okay too. And that kind of helps you fill the gap. This is where we can, you know, um, be a little bit more clear. And I don't want to say take advantage of COVID, but it does make it a little bit easier because so many of us have been in the same boat. Okay. So I, have, I have another question related uh, since we're kind of on this history yep. and gaps. And I'm going to read this one to you just to make sure I get um, this question correct. As someone who has had experience more than 25 plus years in the workforce, several different employers, and she uh, they feel it's appropriate to drop some of the older um, experience from the resume, but that leaves gaps. They're, they're dropping it because of the, the length. Um, what's yeah. the recommended way? Like, do you kind of pick and choose relevant? And Well, so um, there would be a gap in this instance. Um, that is more of a kind of best or normal practice in that. And what I mean by that is um, if the experience is that much older, you just don't put it on there anyway, regardless, because it's not relevant. And that's more of like a common practice with the resume. So technically in this instance, it wouldn't really be considered a gap, right. if that makes sense. Okay. So you're highlighting relevant work experience. Yeah, and more recent work experience. So in this instance, it's not a gap. And then what about the, I mean, I've heard this from for over 20 years. Should you limit your resume to one page? 
Um, our argument or opinion is that no, you should not. Um, we find that it's a one page resume usually is more appropriate for a more recent college grad. So for if any alumni are um, here that are only a year out, for example, and they just don't have that much work experience, one pager all day long. But we normally recommend and see a two page resume. We've heard, a, you know, from a, a few clients, industry specific wise, um, every once in a while, certain industries are like, no, I only want a one page, but we find that's kind of few and far between. And for people that have that much more work experience, like that are closer to my age, 48, whatever, you just can't put any, everything on one page, it just won't work. So we usually see and recommend two pages. Great question. Okay. So um, a couple of other things too, related to employment history, again, to make it kind of compelling and readable, like we're talking about specifically today. Um, some of the things that you also wanna make sure you do in your employment history is you wanna make sure that all of your sentences start with really active verbs, like I managed, I developed, I created, et cetera, not just kind of passive language. For past jobs, obviously you do wanna use past tense. For your current position, use present tense. Make sure that your tense is um, consistent and correct throughout. That's another kind of common mistake we find with our clients too. The second thing that we want you to think about too, and then I wanna tell you a little bit more about the third one as well, because this is something a lot of people struggle with. Um, we also want you to make sure that you are selecting like the top five to seven, give or take accomplishments for each job that best highlight the successes and accomplishments or achievements within that job that would be relevant to that position. So don't make your employment history just a glorified list of tasks. These are the things that I did. Because when you look at this last point here about measurable results wherever possible, for all they know, maybe you created this marketing plan, for all they know, it was a flop and nothing happened as a result. It was terrible. And we realized that not everyone can come up with tangible, measurable results. Not everyone is in fundraising or in sales where it was a certain number of you know, products they sold and this amount of revenue for the company. So as much as possible, though, think about what the result was of you being there. So just quick example, if someone worked, let's say, as an admin in a doctor's office and they, whatever, rearranged the waiting room to help um, improve patient inflow and kind of intake. And even if, let's say, the office didn't measure how much more patients were seen on a given basis or a daily basis, but they just knew that that happened because of what they saw through the office or whatever it was. Even if you can't, if that person couldn't include numbers, they could say rearranged and organized office space or waiting room to enhance patient, patient intake process and increase the number of patients seen. You don't have a number, that's okay, but you've at least spelled out what you know happened as a result. So as much as possible, there are things, if you were kind of imagining I was sitting there on your shoulder and saying, well, so what, why should this person care about this? Nine times out of 10, our clients can spit that out to us and explain why it actually had an impact. Did you help your boss focus on you know, sales like they were supposed to? Did you enable your team members to make the right decision as a result of the data analysis that you performed? That's the kind of stuff that you can actually spill out, okay? Quick couple of examples here for employment history. And if you choose um, a kind of this hybrid model of the functional as well as the chronological, these are the ways that you can highlight some of the strengths that would be transferable over to this new position that you might be looking at or new industry and examples of what you can say under each. So adept multitasker, versatile writing skills, et cetera. Those are a couple of quick examples. We talked already about the COVID impact, oops, sorry, I went too fast, hold on, employment history. 
um, if any of your recent accomplishments were put on hold because of COVID-19. Again, you can just reference that there. And remember too, that any classes that you've taken or volunteer experience that you've had during this time, we actually do want you to put those on your resume because in lieu of actual employment that you've had, if you were laid off or furloughed, um, for example, those things do count and matter, especially these days because online learning is such, a, it's a much bigger deal than it used to be, again, given we're all working remotely, et cetera, okay? Um, well, uh, we've got yeah. a question about COVID and Good. this is the perfect um, time. Where under your professional work experience would you mention being laid off due to COVID? So this is a, a matter of order. Would you list your experience first, your like maybe your experiences and then that you were laid off or would you put it at the top? Put it at the top. Put it at the top. Yeah, I, because I mean, and I'm making the assumption that you were laid off like in your most recent job. If you've had a job since then, and for whatever reason you want, you would put that first. And for whatever reason, like if your job right before that was very short mm -hmm. and you want to explain why it was so short, you could put there, like just at the, like right underneath that job title, you know, um, position was, or, you know, time at position was short due to COVID-19. But outside of that, put it at the top. Hopefully that answers. Okay, good. All right, cool. Okay, so let's keep going here for just a second. I don't, okay. Here's where we talked about the font. So remember we talked about Arial, Garamond, Verdana. Those are the three that we like. Remember that when you're creating your cover letter, by the way, to go with your resume, you want it to have the same header and kind of formatting and all of that. If they ask you um, for a cover letter, um, if they don't ask you for a cover letter, we don't recommend submitting or including one. Follow the instructions of what they're saying um, to go along with the application, just kind of by the way. Um, so we're kind of getting close to time. I wanted to go ahead and move to Q&A because this is the, you know, the content we've got for today too. I'm gonna put, we are actually doing just really quickly while people are plugging in their questions and kind of formulating them too. We are actually through my company, we're doing coffee with the coach to talk more about um, additional kind of resume hacks. So if any alum want to attend that, feel free to, we're gonna put that up there. We're trying to provide content to people in kind of different ways. but. Bro go ahead and let me know what other questions we've got to please. Yeah, I think Terrence and I are going to tag team, but um, right. most recent question we have is where would professional association leadership experience fit best in a resume? Um, you know, volunteer leadership within your industry, maybe there's a national association and you served in a leadership role. Where would you put that? That would go at the bottom, unless for some reason, the job you're applying for um, requires or they want someone who, you know, has been in that type of role and mm -hmm. the experience could be relevant, I would still leave the whole thing at the bottom, but you may want to reference, you know, association leader in your summary so that it's up there at the top and kind of, you know, directs them to it. Okay. But otherwise it goes at the bottom. And Hallie, there's another question here. Um, I'm seeing one and I've definitely had this question a lot um, over the years. Um, I've been, if you've been out of the workforce for many years due to a family health crisis, how would you frame that gap? Yes, we get that question too. It's totally understandable. So we would actually reference that you, you know, say something like um, family leave or sabbatical. I would actually probably say, you know, family leave of absence taken this time to the, you know, this date to this date. And you can just put under there, you know, um, emergency family leave required to care for um, an ailing family member or something like that. Just a quick sentence to explain it, but that's completely acceptable to do. People understand that that happens. So I would put that. Great question. Um, I, let's see. Can you have a more generalized resume, maybe a non-tailored, if you don't have a specific industry you're looking at? 
Yes, that's a really good question, actually, too, because we get that as well. And sometimes we have to help clients with a more general resume. We always want people to be as tailored as possible. But yes, you can have a more general resume, but make sure, for example, that if you're doing that, you're at least highlighting and focusing on transferable strengths and skills. For example, project management, program management, um, operations. So even if it's not highly tailored, make sure that you're talking about and using kind of keywords that would translate across the board to lots of different types of positions, if that makes sense. And we're getting some questions about uh, copies of the slides and I will put um, your email, even though we've got it right here at the bottom of the screen for a copy of the presentation, the slide deck, you'll email admin at halliecrawford.com. And then uh, for a copy of the recording today, we will send a follow-up email um, no later than tomorrow with an edited copy of the recording today. So if you logged in late or had to leave early, we'll have a full recording that will be uh, sent out, so. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brooke, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and just by the way, too, I wanted to say, if we don't get to everyone's questions, keep our email. We'd be happy to answer via email, too, so that you don't feel pressured to, like, get it all. Because we know that once you start working on things, sometimes other questions pop up. So happy to answer those. Keep our email for that as well. It takes a little bit of the pressure off, too. Good. Um, and then another kind of plug for upcoming presentations. Next week, Terrence and I are going to uh, have a presentation just on the ways that TCU can support you if you are in a job search, a current job search right now, or if you are considering one in the future, just kind of want to learn a little bit more about the resources that are available to all alumni. Um, you can join us next week. Uh, Terrence and I will be meeting on the 15th at noon, right at the lunch hour uh, central time. And then for the last week of June, I think it's the last week of June, it's on the 23rd, Hallie will be back again to talk about uh, the do's and don'ts, the ins and outs of informational interviews. And I think it's a great way to explore other industries or if you're trying to decide whether or not you wanna try something new, I think that's gonna be a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about that. So that'll be on the 23rd of this month. Right. Have your resume Terrence, ready before that. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just say, Terrence, you want to talk about uh, your what you just put there in the chat? Absolutely, Brooke. Just a reminder that we do offer services for alumni. All services are free for life. So whether you're a career changer or looking to kind of spruce up the resume, um, I took like two pages of notes somewhere <laughs> in my notepad. So um, just again, a refresher and a reset on how things have evolved, um, like the colors and the fonts and those things are just refreshers for me. So when I meet with you, I want to make sure that the message is consistent with Hallie was saying totally rings true of what I typically would say, but I'm getting a few extra nuggets to provide to alums as well. So you go to tcu.joinhandshake.com to make an appointment with me. Um, I'm actually doing in-person appointments now. Thank goodness we're getting back to some sense of normalcy. Also Zoom, also phones available. I had an alum from Wilmington, North Carolina. I met with just this morning on Zoom. So no matter where you are, whether you're here or there, we're happy to provide those services for you or free services for life. So thanks for allowing me to shoot through that little plug, Brooke, I appreciate it. Yeah, one of the silver linings I think of this last year is we've all suddenly become more comfortable with meeting virtually. And so we really can reach our alumni no matter where you are. So, okay, this is a very interesting question. Um, I was a professional ballet dancer before my current role four years ago. And I started to share, shy away from including that on my resume thinking it was no longer relevant experience. But how, um, but I do feel many of my work ethic skills have come from that experience. Would you say this experience gives me an edge or is it not relevant? And I think a lot of people who maybe had a, a stint in any kind of performance, whether athletic or the arts, they had like a, a first act, if you will, in their career. What, what, what are your thoughts, Hallie? Yeah, no, it helps you stand out. It's very unique. So mm -hmm. I would actually suggest, I think your gut instinct is good to include it. And just so put it on there and include it um, and just make sure that the bullet points underneath um, about what you learned and um, 
what leadership strengths that you exhibited, anything that would be relevant to a job, reference that there, the transferable skills and stuff. But I absolutely would put it on there um, because I think there's a lot that you can gain, um, not just from that profession, but to your point, Brooke, with, you know, and entertainment and, you know, kind of performing in, in that way. So definitely include it and just make sure that the bullet points you have underneath would be transferable over to the jobs that you're looking at. That would be great. I think it's very cool. I love it. Looks like people are making connections right here in the chat. Um, so I, I love that. And speaking of other connections, um, I want to mention Horn Fox Connect, which is our exclusive to TCU alumni networking platform. Uh, think about it's similar to LinkedIn, but it's just for TCU. And thank you, Terrence, for putting that. It's a great way to connect with other, other alumni. You'll automatically be in a group page for your school and college, um, maybe more than one, depending on what your, de your degree was in. And lots of job opportunities are being shared by alumni and also the Center for Career Professional Development that are relevant experiences for you, no matter kind of where you are in your career. So definitely uh, head over there and check that out. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Making sure I've caught all of them. I see one here, Brooke, that really rings true for, all of it rings true. <laughs> yeah. But the applicant tracking system, Hallie, um, oh, yeah. I learned about a resource called JobScan. I'm not sure if you heard of that, Hallie. It helps people kind of make it through the applicant tracking systems. But Amanda's question, I'm having a hard time getting past the ATS program. For example, that sometimes we'll ask for edit instead of edited, <laughs> leads instead of led. Mm -hmm. Just any thought you have about making it past those applicant tracking systems. Keywords are huge, but any other suggestions? Yeah, so jobscan.co, I just put it in the um, chat. That's it. And by the way, everyone, it's .co, it's not .com. People always think that's a typo, but that's the website. That would be my biggest recommendation because that's very good. I think you get a couple of scans free. I'm not sure if they've changed that or not. Um, make sure that you have keywords that, like, don't have too many keywords. I would say, you know, like, the on the examples that we gave, like, no more than 10 keywords. If you start to have too many, it starts to kind of diffuse the message. Um, and the keywords should be, like, in present tense versus past tense, I would say that as well. And then make sure too that they're, like we said earlier, they're not in a table or in a column that they're like in one long list, kind of just separated by something that they can um, scan. The other thing that I think is important as well for the human eye is um, make sure that your keywords are in order of priority and importance. Mm -hmm. Some of our clients will put like a keyword that's like not really that important to the job and they'll put that first. And I always tell them to put that at the end of the list too. So that's my best advice about the scanning systems. I can't say I'm the world's leading expert on them, but that's what I've heard so far. And that's great advice. We have a, a friend from the TCU Human Resources Department who's on today and she sent a message uh, following along the, that advice, so that's great. Okay, okay two more questions and then we'll stop from there. Again, we are so glad that everybody took the time to uh, join us today, but how critical is an elaborate LinkedIn presence? Um, when you say elaborate, I would say that you, number one, instead of thinking of elaborate, you need to have a LinkedIn presence. And what I mean by that is a photo for sure, Mm -hmm. um, an about section that sells you. It doesn't have to be that long. A couple of paragraphs is enough. And that you've got, um, what am I trying to say? Results oriented accomplishments and successes in each of your sections in your professional experience. It's pretty mm -hmm. important because that's how some people will actually find you versus getting your resume. Um, and when they do get your resume, that's one of the first places they're going to look is on LinkedIn. So it's yeah. important to have it like have the basics. It doesn't have to be all fancy with videos and stuff, but at least have those basics is very important. Yeah. And then uh, one last question about listing community, volunteer or external board involvement. Is that important to list or no? I think it's important because it shows that you're well-rounded. So list it on your resume, 
just put it at the bottom. But I absolutely would because it shows that you've been doing something else besides just working and shows interest. It's a talking point for an interview. It could be a common point of connection between you and the interviewer too. So absolutely put it on there. It's good. Okay, we have like 60 seconds. So I'm gonna throw this one in there. Would you include a photo on your resume if the job you're applying for would target gender or would? No, no. just don't. No, just don't. Nope. Okay, great. For American US society, they do that um, in some um, Middle Eastern countries and in Europe in some cases, but mm -hmm. for resumes in the US, no, don't do it. Okay. Very good. Well, this has been so enlightening. Thank you so much, Holly. And we look forward to having you back in a couple of weeks. Thank and you. for those of you who are able to join Terrence and I next week, we uh, look forward to seeing you all then and check your email for resources uh, regarding today's presentation within the next day. We'll give you a copy of the recording and another resource from Holly. So thank you all and have a great day. Go Thanks, Frogs. Everybody. Go Frogs.